Hi, I'm Sarah Andrews, and I'll talk about liver transplant in patients with alcohol use, the past, present, and future. I have no relevant disclosures. So today, the learning objects, objectives will be one, to review the history of liver transplant, including different surgical techniques, as well as the advancements in immunosuppressives. Number two, to understand the current practice of early transplantation and alcohol-related liver disease and how there's been a huge movement away from the six-month rule of abstinence. And lastly, to identify future goals and challenges surrounding liver transplantation, specifically goals of remain decreasing relapse rates and also engaging in treatment post-transplant. So starting with the history of liver transplant, the first documented documented successful transplant was in the 1800s with a skin transplant. Even though there were ancient reports of skin flaps as early as 800 BC, this first documented transplant was really a stepping stone for the other transplants to begin. So at the beginning of the 20th century, the first cornea transplant was performed. And over the next 50 years, transplant overall for solid organs was underway. Early living donors were biological relatives of recipients due to decreased risk of organ rejection. And the first successful living kidney transplant was between identical twin brothers in 1954. Although other organs were experimented for the last 100 years, liver transplant was not documented until 1952 with the first canine liver transplant. By the 1960s, there had been over 80 canine liver transplants, which really set the building blocks for liver transplant in humans as we know now. In 1963, the first human liver transplant was attempted in a pediatric patient with biliary atresia. Unfortunately, the recipient ended up dying interoperatively due to bleeding. The first successful liver transplant was also in a pediatric patient in 1967, which was a patient with hepatic cellular carcinoma. The recipient ended up living for 13 years months post-transplant until she died from metastatic disease. For the next two decades, there was intermittent success with liver transplants due to challenges with donors, as well as recipient selection and immunosuppressive challenges and infection complications. During this time period, there was no successful method of preventing rejection. So chances of a successful outcome were slim, but transplant continued because there were so many, there was very limited resources for end-stage organ failure. There continued to be steady progress in transplantation, and there was ongoing experience in patient management related to immunosuppressives, which also led to less related infections and disease. In 1976, there was ongoing progress, which reached another milestone with the development of cyclosporin as an immunosuppressant. And that cyclosporin led to improvement of transplant outcomes because of the decreased risk of organ rejection. The use of partial deceased and living donor grafts began in the 1980s, starting again in the pediatric population. With improved immunosuppressives as well as surgical techniques with cyclosporin and reduced size liver transplants, the one-year survival rate improved to almost 70%. Due to the improvements in outcomes, the NIH Consensus Conference in 1983 established liver transplantation as a treatment for end-stage liver disease. In 1990s, the first successful living donor segmental liver transplant was completed in Australia. So there are some religious and cultural influences for the living donation, especially in countries that don't accept brain death. But this laid the foundation for advancements within the living donor procedure. With expansion of transplant programs and the improvement in outcomes, by the 1990s, the number of patients on the wait list actually ended up exceeding the available supply. So as such, the U.S., within the United Network of Organ Sharing and the UNOS began a protocol to rank patients. So this initial protocol was based on wait time as well as medical need. But because some centers started listing their patients very early, this created some controversy and there was more of a push for objective um, information for the wait list. So in 1999, in response, UNOS started using the MELD score, which is the model for end-stage liver disease, which was adopted in the US in 2002. MELD is based on objective information, not on waitlist time, specifically serum, INR, bilirubin, as well as creatinine. Other countries followed suit years later by using MELD. For the next decade, liver transplantation continued, but as further research developed, the use of liver transplantation for those with alcohol-related liver disease started to expand. In 2011, there is the first landmark pilot study for early liver transplantation for patients with alcohol-related hepatitis, which was published and really paved the way for reevaluating liver transplantation in those with alcohol use histories. 
Liver transplantation has continued to expand as compared to 1984 when there were less than 20 different liver transplant centers worldwide. By 2013, in over 80 countries, there was hundreds of centers. With, in regards to the current state of transplantation, the number of transplant each year has steadily increased, including for liver organs. Despite the constraints of the COVID pandemic in 2021, the most lives ever saved in organ transplantation, which was 40, 000, over 40,000 in 2021. There was an increase of almost 6% from the year prior. In 2021, set records for kidney, heart, and liver transplants. There was nearly 25,000 kidneys, over 9,000 livers, and 3,800 heart transplants. And liver transplants have set records for the last nine years. At Johns Hopkins from 2007 into 2022, there's also been an increase of transplants, including liver transplants. So you can see here from the chart, deceased and living donor transplants, especially living, have been steadily increasing, as well as the total number of organs. In 2021, there was a total of 134 liver transplants, both from deceased and living donors, completed at Hopkins, and 427 total organ transplants. As transplants have increased, the survival rate has also improved significantly. So here's the survival data from January of 2019 to June of 2021. There is a small carve out period due to COVID from March of 2020 until June of 2020. And the outcomes that are typically monitored are one year graft survival as well as recipient survival. So Hopkins is comparable to the national average around 94% for all liver recipients for both one year graft as well as recipient survival. And as you can see here, living donor recipients as for graft survival is slightly greater than deceased donor. As the number of transplants have completed on a national level, as well as at Hopkins has been on the steady rise with ongoing improvements, there's also been changes in the landscape of transplant. Previously, chronic hepatitis C had significant disease burden, but after the use of effective antivirals for treatment, end-stage liver disease due to chronic hep C has been on the decline. So that's also decreased the need for liver transplantation as a medical intervention for those with chronic hep C. At the same time, the incidence of alcohol-associated liver disease has been on the steady rise. The rate of alcohol use has also increased overall in the last 10 years. So as such, right now, alcohol liver disease is now the most common indication for liver transplant. Given the high mortality rates for patients with acute alcohol-associated hepatitis and those who do not respond to medical treatment, which is 70% at six months and 90% at one year, there began a movement towards early transplantation and challenging a six-month rule of abstinence. Historically, a six-month rule of, has been in place for patients undergoing liver transplant for alcohol-related disease, which includes both alcohol-related cirrhosis as well as hepatitis. The six-month interval was initially justified on the basis that it would grant patients time to physically recover as well as provide time to demonstrate abstinence from alcohol. However, there's been no significant data to back up this rule. The six-month rule effectively excluded those with acute alcohol-related hepatitis given the high mortality rate. As such, a more thoughtful approach began to evolve in regards to assessing appropriate candidates for transplant, and that risk of relapse should not be assessed primarily on a time of abstinence. Rather than relying entirely on this arbitrary six-month rule, there's been several other instruments that can help determine the risk of drinking post-transplant. So one instrument is called the University of Michigan Alcoholism Prognosis Score, which is specific to liver transplant in those with alcohol liver disease. And there's several factors that Isolation previous treatment of alcohol use insight into. So it's continued alcohol use after liver disease sickness, low motivation for alcohol treatment, poor stress management, and the factors this is 
to do it. With these instruments being utilized in different studies as well as on the clinical base, none of them, as you can see, included time of abstinence. In 2011, there was a landmark study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This prospective study showed the significant survival rate in patients receiving liver transplants for acute alcohol than 2% were chosen for liver transplant. The criteria consisted of the following, no prior episodes of liver decompensation, strong social supports, commitment to abstinence from alcohol post-transplant, as well as a complete consensus among the transplant committee in regards to moving on to transplant. There were 26 patients that were in the study that underwent liver transplantation with an average MEL score of 34. The six month survival rate was 77% in these patients compared to 23% of match controls that did not undergo transplant. At two years, only 15%, which was three out of the 20 surviving patients returned to alcohol use. However, the return to alcohol use did not have any significant impact on graft functioning. These results challenged the six month rule and paved the way for further research into early transplantation. Following the Matherin landmark study, the impact of France was almost immediate. So there was a survey that was sent out to French transplant centers, and 97% of those that responded said that they would now use early transplantation for those with alcohol-related hepatitis. However, the U.S. response was slower and then followed by further pilot studies. A study out of Mount Sinai in New York was conducted with nine early liver transplant patients for alcohol-related hepatitis. The six-month survival benefit was 89% compared to 11% without a transplant. And the study also had a very stringent selection criteria with over 90% that were excluded due to psychosocial concerns. At the two-month follow-up, one of the transplant patients had relapsed. A subsequent pilot study was added from Hopkins with 17 patients, and these patients were compared to 36 transplant patients with alcohol-related cirrhosis with at least six months of sobriety. The six-month survival was similar amongst the two groups, 100 versus 89%, as were the rates of relapse, 24 versus 29. In those with early liver transplantation, however, these patients had increased risk of binge drinking episodes as well as more frequent drinking on a daily basis as compared to alcohol-related cirrhosis patients who underwent transplant. This study, similar to other pi prior pilots, had an exclusion rate of over 90%. While there were several single center studies, there was developing momentum to create an even larger study. A multi-study was developed called the American Consortium of Early Liver Transplantation for Alcoholic Hepatitis. And this study involved 12 different centers that enrolled 147 early liver transplant recipients from the years 2006 until 2017. The criteria for selection included first episode of hepatic decompensation without any prior diagnosis of liver disease, strong social supports, commitment to lifelong abstinence from alcohol post-transplant. And the survival rates for this study were similar at around 94% and 84% at one in three years. And these survival rates were similar to as compared to all patients who undergo liver transplantation for other diagnoses. The rates of relapse were also low at 10% and 17% and one and three years at post-transplant. Even though there was significant data to demonstrate the benefits of early transplantation for patients with alcohol-related hepatitis, there was still lacking consensus in regards to the selection criteria and the process. So as such, in April of 2019, a group of liver transplant experts gathered and discussed selection criteria. And the selection criteria proposed was based on urgency, utility, as well as equity. So urgency being that the sickest patients would get transplanted first using the MELD score. Utility, evaluating post-transplant outcomes, specifically relapse rates, although there was not one single recommended relapse risk assessment tool that the consensus gave. There's also equity, being that the selection process being fair and objective and not excluding those with alcohol use. So there was no defined length of abstinence that was recommended, given that the data recently, time and time again, had confirmed that the six-month rule was not reliable or useful. The flow of appropriate completing early liver transplant started with the criteria of the first presentation 
of, with decompensated liver disease. And from there, if they had no uncontrolled comorbidities, as well as, and if they were non-responsive to medical therapy, the next step would be the psychosocial assessment. And within the psychosocial assessment, things that were very necessary to assess for were the low risk of relapse post-transplant, acceptance of illness, so excesses of alcohol use, as well as commitment to lifelong abstinence, as well as strong social supports, which is very necessary post-transplant for successful transplants. The next stage after the psychosocial assessment would be a consensus from the committee presenting the patient at the transplant committee and having everyone approve going forward, which the next step would be liver transplantation. And from liver transplantation, the next step is post-liver transplant follow-up as well as alcohol use disorder treatment. From there, monitoring relapse as well as follow up with addiction specialists is needed. And then the other main thing is making sure to monitor center outcomes. As early liver transplantation has become more prevalent and the Dallas consensus helped create a more ethical and transparent criteria for transplanting these patients, the most challenging part became evident with post-transplant care. Although it's been demonstrated the significant improvement in mortality, and there's comparable survival as well as relapse rates, patients were still found to have relapsed and some returning to harmful drinking. The return to heavy alcohol use or any use remains a big concern for all alcohol-related liver transplant patients for both early as well as standard liver transplant. And it's been estimated that almost 30% of early liver transplant patients relapse at some point, which is similar to the overall rate of relapse in all alcohol-related transplants. One of the other issues is that patients are notoriously unreliable for reporting events, which includes recent alcohol use. There is one study that showed that 38% of pre-liver transplant patients ended up testing positive for alcohol use using a biomarker ETG, compared to only 4% admitting to their alcohol use and self-report. So the biomarker ETG, ETG is a urine biomarker for recent alcohol consumption, but only monitors the consumption for the last few days. Since patients underreport alcohol use, there's an increased need for useful biomarkers and objective data to evaluate for recent alcohol consumption, which led to a development of another biomarker, PETH. So PETH is a direct metabolite of alcohol consumption and is formed only in the presence of alcohol. So it's highly specific for recent drinking. It detects heavy alcohol use up to two to three weeks following a drinking episode, which is an improvement from ETG, which only monitors alcohol use up to a few days after the last drink. So the earliest studies of PETH occurred in the late 2010s, and now PETH is commonly used to monitor alcohol use in liver transplant patients. It can monitor relapse rates post-transplant, as well as monitor absence pre-transplant. So a PETH positive, the typical cutoff is greater than 50, and there's some evidence that shows less than 200 is consistent, but not excessive use, or greater than 200 is excessive but it is still hard to determine exactly. And so there's more research that's being done with the PETH as a biomarker. And although biomarkers can help monitor relapse rates, it doesn't necessarily prevent a relapse, but can only provide objective data. So there is still a significant need to help prevent the relapse. So early liver transplant studies have emphasized the need for further interventions, but there's been a specific inf uh, emphasis on pre-transplant alcohol treatment and limited attention to post-transplant resources. In order to better study outcomes of patients with alcohol-associated hepatitis undergoing liver transplantation, Dr. Andrew Cameron at Hopkins and colleagues in the Department of Surgery, including Dr. Betsy McCall within our department, were awarded a P50 grant to establish a new alcohol research center. And I've been working with Dr. McCall and several others as a co-investigator on the second project entitled optimization of post-transplant care via biomarkers and behavioral interventions. So the study involves post-transplant patients randomized to either the alcohol integrated treatment or treatment as usual group. So the research is to help determine the effectiveness of integrating alcohol treatment within liver transplant patient care. So the patient that was interviewed today was in the al integrated alcohol treatment group and has completed all aspects of the study. Components of the integrated alcohol treatment group involve a computerized brief alcohol intervention, as well as clinical monitoring and treatment adherence counseling. The computerized based brief intervention is sometimes patients can complete it prior to discharge or they can complete it after discharge from the hospital after transplant. 
and it's information about alcohol use, suggesting steps in order to stay alcohol free. And this part of the intervention is specific to liver transplant. The next part is alcohol monitoring visits, which is completed with the study nurse. And it's initially the frequency is much more frequent. Month one, it's weekly. Month two, it's every other week. Months three and six, it's a monthly visit. And then for the rest of the study, it's every other month. And the study nurse meets with the participants and talks about the alcohol use and how the intervention is going. So part of the intervention is also CBT for CBT. So there's numerous evidence-based treatments for alcohol use disorder, which can include single session brief alcohol intervention, as well as multi-session cognitive behavioral therapy. And this intervention, the CBT for CBT has been shown to reduce alcohol use and be very engaging for patients. So the next part is text messaging, which, patient, which participants can opt into for the first three months after joining the study. And the participants will receive text messages about how to cope with alcohol cravings and triggers, as well as how to handle risky situations and other motivational messages. For further treatment options are available for both the integrated alcohol treatment group, as well as the treatment as usual group. And this may involve medications for cravings for alcohol use or more intensive treatment or referrals or mental health referrals as well. For CBT for CBT, it's a computer-based program. It was developed at Yale University through randomized clinical trials. So it teaches cognitive and behavioral skills to help people gain control of their alcohol or drug use. And the one that's within the study, the CBT for CBT is specifically for alcohol use. So the skills that it includes is recognizing patterns of use, coping with cravings, improving decision-making, and learning how to say no effectively. And within the seven different sessions within the CBT, there's different lessons, including recognizing triggers, dealing with cravings, stop and think, stay safe, go against the flow, pan plan, don't panic, and stand up for yourself. So all subjects in the study involved are also involved in follow-up research visits for both the treatment as usual, as well as the integrated alcohol treatment group. And the visits are at the end of months one, three, six, nine, and 12. And the participants are asked about their drinking, their any recent drug use, smoking, as well as mood and anxiety. Peth testing is also performed as well as saliva sample for alcohol and drugs. So my role within this part is to provide psychiatric consultations for those that screen at risk, either on the GAD for anxiety or the PHQ-9 scale for mood. So the goal of the study is to recruit 20 patients total and two to one patients are offered the integrated alcohol treatment. And anyone with alcohol liver disease with a recent tr liver transplant may join the study. So thus far, there's been 45 participants that have been consented, two to one again in the treatment group. 21, 21 of the participants were early transplant and 24 standard. From those in early transplant, 14 were in the integrated alcohol treatment yes, and I'll seven in the treatment start, um, The first participant consented was in November of 2020 of and completed the study a year later. 13 participants so far have completed the study, seven from integrated alcohol treatment and six from treatment as usual. Unfortunately, 11 patients have been lost to follow up or withdrew from the study. 59 subjects declined to participate when they were approached about the study. Of those subjects, seven are now deceased and two patients were non-English speaking. 51 declined due to multiple reasons. And some of the reasons that they gave was that they felt that they were already sober. They didn't need any additional help. They didn't have any triggers or any cravings to drink alcohol. Some used um, decline due to moving out of state. Others felt like they didn't have any time for the study or they had too many other medical appointments or commitments. And some were already in different treatment programs. Currently, there's 15 patients that were referred and being actively recruited into the study. So the future of transplant will really focus on post-transplant care. And part of it is how do we encourage patients to engage in alcohol treatment post-transplant? And within the study, one thing that we'll be doing is trying to look at those who had declined to participate and figure out if there's a pattern within that and how we can help shape future recruitment for those um, patients. And also it's about helping reduce relapse rates post-transplant. Now that we have better biomarkers with PEP, we can help determine the rates of relapse, but then the next step is how do we focus treatment to actually reduce those rates? So in summary, 
we spoke about the history of liver transplant and how surgical techniques as well as immunosuppressives have improved outcomes in terms of transplant. The present being the current practice of early transplantation for alcohol-related disease and moving away from the six-month rule of abstinence and looking at other factors that can help predict risk of relapse. And then the future being goals and challenges surrounding liver transplantation, which will be to help monitor the relapse rates as well as as well as try to engage patients into treatment. So I want to thank several people, including Dr. Betsy McCall, as well as Maisha, who's the study nurse, and Aram, who's the study coordinator for this part of the uh, P50 grant, as well as Dr. Franklin for presenting the patient and general the Comprehensive Transplant Center. Thank you, Dr. Andrews. Great presentation. I, I learned a lot. Uh, um, I found myself thinking as, uh, as you were talking about the idea that it seems like you shouldn't, there, sh a trans there shouldn't be a transplant center who transplants people with alcoholic liver disease that doesn't have the ability to provide really good care for, for alcoholism post-transplant. And then it sounds like the study you're describing, if I understand correctly, is essentially trying to prove what I was intuiting, and I, I, mean, I suppose we all intuit, that is that you would think that providing this kind of comprehensive um, systematic care ought to lead to better outcomes than saying to people, well, you ought to make sure you get in treatment after transplant, Go, you know, hope you can find something. Uh, you never know. I mean, the reason you do studies is because because things you intuit don't always work out. But it sure seems like it ought to work out that way. Uh, do I, I guess I'm wondering if if you or or the people involved in in this project more broadly um, envision trying to establish national standards that that require transplant centers to have comprehensive addiction programs. Yeah, I think that would be the goal, and it would be great to be able to help develop a plan or help develop research and a study that shows that integrating the alcohol treatment within the transplant center is going to be helpful for patients in terms of relapse as well as outcomes post-transplant. Thanks. Um, other folks have questions? Uh, while you're thinking, I'll ask you another thing, which is uh, you were talking about the six-month rule, uh, and I guess how that's no longer something that 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 seems uh, uh, like an important uh, necessary screening criteria. Uh, but I think I heard you say that in the New England Journal paper from France, did, did I hear you say that it was fewer than 2% of the, the patients screened wound up go, going into the study? Yeah. Uh, that's an awful lot of screening. And, 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 and I'm imagining that there continues to be a lot of important filters that that, that are laid down. I mean, I, and, and maybe you mentioned them, they just didn't stick. Are there, what are the big things that rule people out in this context? So within that study, things that rule people out that it had to be the first episode of decompensated liver disease. They needed to have strong social supports, commitment to lifelong abstinence. And what about today at Johns, at Johns Hopkins? What are the big things? That rule people out? So I think those are also some, especially strong social supports, I think is a very big, element of it. Um, as, as in a lot of people don't have them? or Some people might not in trying to help. I think the idea of screening, like my goal is to not just screen patients out, but try to provide resources to get them to become better candidates. So even if mm -hmm. these patients are initially not candidates, how do we get them to become more appropriate candidates? How do we help mm -hmm. them gain social supports? How do we help them identify people that can help them post-transplant? Um, mm -hmm. How do we work with them to gain insight into their illness, to understand and appreciate the, the situation that they're in. So I think it's not just, okay, they're not appropriate for transplant, we're not gonna transplant them ever, right. but how do we work to figure out how we can appropriately transplant mm -hmm. them? That's interesting, yeah, way to think about it. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Other folks? Is that Dr. Swartz? I think you know, that's something where we get to really rely on 
education report rather than the way that we will set hearings and other things and other kinds of programs. How do you think that changes the future of helping state and state programs? Yeah, why don't you repeat the question for the folks yeah, out so the there in Zoom was, land? How can PETH or the biomarker help other populations? Um, so I will say that within other transplant groups, they are using PETH if someone had alcohol use in the past, or if they're concerned about their alcohol use, um, we are getting PETHs on those patients. And I do think there is a role for it, um, depending on the patient and depending on the goals of treatment. I think there is a role for it if we're concerned about someone underreporting their drinking, or maybe if that's affecting their mood and we and they're not really telling us. I think there is a role to evaluate for it and have objective data to be like, you are drinking or you're actually not drinking, you know? So I think, I think it is, can be very helpful. And is PETH something that anybody can order? Uh, it's mm -hmm. available, it happens to everybody yes, who wants to order. it does take several, yeah, several days to come back, but it can be ordered now at Hopkins. Okay, so it's not for use in the emergency room. No. Right, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, other folks, Dr. Kalika? Yeah, so I think that's changed over the course of the study and trying to figure out the best time to approach patients about the study. And it's, my understanding is that it's probably not the best time, right? When they're immediately post-transplant, they have all these other things going on. They're so overwhelmed and kind of approaching them a bit after transplant too has been more successful in terms of recruitment. Dr. Burke. It's a very good question. Yeah, you want to yeah. So it. the question was if there's any relationship between the immunosuppressives and relapse. It's a good question. I don't know. Um, I don't know if there are. That's a good, that'd be a good thing to look into. Other folks. Let me ask you this. Um, come back to the question about the comprehensive treatment in a given place like Hopkins. Is there reason to think, I'm just kind of trying to think about whether people are likely to do better if they actually have a comprehensive addiction program in the same center where they got their, their transplant. And I guess I'm sort of thinking maybe it partly about the kind of question Dr. Berg just asked, that is the intersection be between interactions like drug interactions, but, but also um, integrated treatment coordinated treatment and people talking to each other. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I think there's, I will say, I think the transplant team does an incredible job overall of interacting with all these other working parts when patients have complications post-transplant and really helping with that. Um, I do find over the years that I've been with transplant, there's so many patients that are, that live very far away too. Um, so I think that the the CBT for CBT that's web-based, they can do it in their home, they can do it within that environment, could be very helpful because um, some patients travel hours to get here, even for follow-up appointments. So not everyone's local to have it always in person in terms of the treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other folks, uh, Dr. Franklin. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be great. Um, so part of this- So you wanna repeat yeah. the question? Oh, yeah, so this, the question was, if there's movement to be using more integrated treatment pre-transplant to get patients more prepared for post-transplant or going through the process of transplant. And I do think it would be wonderful. The study right now is just focused on post-transplant outcomes. Yeah. 
Oh, it's Dr. Lurie. <laughs> Hard to recognize people through these big masks. I think, so the question is, if there's been anything that the team has learned with the 13 patients that have completed the study, and I would say that one thing that's been standing out so far is, similar to the patient that was presented, is how much they really appreciated the interventions um, and how it's been going so far. Hmm. Let me ask you, my, our last question given the time, um, let me ask you about the issue of supply and demand. What is the supply of livers? Do, do wait lists tend to, to get long because there's not enough organs to, to go around? Um, I know Dr. Cameron is here. Maybe he might be able to <laughs> talk Dr. on Dr. Cameron, that in terms the of director the of transplant. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Mm. Hi, I am, a, I am on that's, Zoom. That's a sobering note to end on. I didn't, uh, no joke, no pun intended there. Um, but uh, thank you for a terrific presentation. Uh, uh, really helpful, uh, illuminating for all of us. Thank you. Thanks.